Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir al from easymedicaldevice.com. And today I want to uh, introduce you to a person that you know already because she was here on uh, the episode related to clinical uh, trials and to the selection of the CRO. And it's Aletea Viland. Uh, she is back for another episode uh, to help us to understand what is uh, or what means real world data. So this is something that is really uh, important within uh, the medical device uh, industry uh, because with all the information that we get through uh, software, through uh, some uh, application or through some devices, uh, we start to get too many data and now we want to know how to use them and Aletheia will help us uh, to define that. So Aletheia, welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Thank you, Monir. It's great to be back. Thank you so much. Great. So um, now you are at home. <laughs> you are, you know, you know the the episode. You know the podcast. So it's great. So that uh, you can uh, directly uh, help us. So uh, Alethea, as we discussed, so we have now an episode related to real world data or RWD, uh, if I can say. So um, can you help us then to identify what this means and what we can do with that? Absolutely. So all of us are patients, right? And we have been going to the doctors for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, some of us. Um, And there is a huge repository of data that already exists on us in electronic health records. I know across Europe, uh, there are insurance providers who have uh, insurance claims against what a patient may actually have as diagnosed as a disease or particular treatment. Anytime a patient goes into the emergency room, um, you know, data is oftentimes collected on them for which there is or is not an informed consent form. Real world, real world data can also be um, things collected from digital apps, from the Apple Watch, for instance, from wearable technology. And so imagine uh, huge clearinghouses worth of incredible data on millions and billions of, of people worldwide that could be actually analyzed for the benefit of societies. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, those data um, can be really um um, a good help, if I can say, if they are uh, used by people that really are uh, doing that right, who are, that are using them right, but also can be really a harm for us. So um, I think there are some rules, if I can say, to use them and some things that are really important. So uh, what are they? So any data could be from laboratory. Uh, Maybe you have um, a reaction and your physician wishes to take a blood sample. So there are the common uh, CBC data that exists in medical records. They could also be from wearable technology where uh, someone may have a heart disease or cardiac issues and their physician wants them to wear a wearable that is detecting arrhythmias. Um, so so the, it, the sky's the limit today, especially in the age of digital health, um, whereby multiple channels of um, you know, physical behavioral data is being collected on us in real time and is collected somewhere. Uh, it they could even be genetic testing. Um, there's several companies such as 23andMe uh, so, so those are very valuable data to uh, companies, and that would be considered real-world data. And mainly, we have to give our authorization for that. So we have to kind of sign some documents and even maybe say how long they can keep them or this kind of thing. Is it uh, right? Yeah, you know, there's incredible movements underway now. Uh, there's a humanity.com.co, and they are trying to grant and uh, assure that people get a 31st right, a 31st human right to own all of their data so that it is not misused, especially for commercial gain against um, what we stand for is your data belongs to you, my data belongs to me, and there shouldn't be any uh, harm with uh, us having those data used without our permission. 
And um, so, yes, to that that point, there's uh, very valuable things that are happening globally to assure that patients do have uh, the say in terms of whether or not data can be used. So we have uh, data that are, I mean, we, we can have data in many forms, but we have the data that we are just getting for ourselves without really being sick. We have the data that we are getting because we are sick or we want really to diagnose something. Uh, so there is many, many kind of categories. So um, now that we have all those data, um, what can we do with them? Yeah. So in terms of being a medical device company, uh, especially in Europe or perhaps even going to the US FDA, um, what we want to do is think about in terms of your indication for use and your intended use. And that uh, you are already on the market with your CE mark. You may already be on the market with your FDA uh, clearance or authorization. Um, marketing access, potentially even globally, what a lot of the regulators still require are post-market surveillance studies, yeah. right? Yeah. Because Europe and the U.S., especially in the device world, now that we're seeing the advent and the changes of the MDR, where we're getting a little bit more constraint is on post-market surveillance because so many bad things have been happening in devices. Um, so, what you can oftentimes do is so long as that you have authorization clearance, the post-market surveillance piece then is that enduring life cycle, that collection of safety data, the collection of more evidence to generate additional labeling claims. Now, it's not a panacea to use real-world evidence, real-world data, and just throw those data back to the notified body for review or to the FDA for review. There really has to be a systematic approach in that clinical evaluation paradigm. You have to have thought behind how you're going to use digital applications, maybe telemedicine, maybe a little bit of claims data, maybe additional post-market clinical trials, registries, observational studies, et cetera, you cannot just expect that you can throw across the wall the regulators, these dirty data, as you will, without having a real plan of action in terms of what you wish to accomplish with that data. Um, and so the, the term has been, um, it's, it has been sort of thrown out there in the media, and it's the media darling right now to say, oh, I'm associated with real-world data. The fact is it's been existing since the beginning um, of, of paper case report forms and paper health records, and, and it's just uh, catapulted in the digital age. But um, what I often want to caution clients on and your viewers on is, again, it's not a panacea just to throw some data across the fence to your regulatory bodies and the notified body and just have them accept the data, add on a new labeling claim. There needs to be a very controlled program with its use. Yeah, I think I think yeah, you're right. So um, I imagine that you get some real world data. Uh, I think the regulators can ask you, how did you get those? Uh, they can uh, ask you if uh, the tool that you use to get that information is validated, if I can say, or if there is some kind of uh, proof that uh, it's correct and accurate, etc. So I think there is a lot of things that to be careful in terms of collection of data. As you said, it's data, but it's maybe dirty data. So we have to, if I can say, clean them at one point. So find a way to clean them. Yes, exactly, Monir. You know, uh, if you think about it, they're not in controlled settings. It's just a, a disparate data that exists out there in lots of different systems. And some of them may be Part 11 compliant, others may not be. Some may be on an app that your cousin Vinny uh, designed. And, you know, so to your point, because we're in a paradigm of, of uh, clinical quality, regulatory, um, making sure we're ISO standards and uh, IE standards, et cetera, we want to be sure that anything that we are sending to the regulatory agencies and the notified body uh, certainly have the right context around the quality, the data integrity, and to your point, the validation of those technologies to assure that the data is valid. 
Yeah, and um, so is there a way to make it to make it valid or to to structure the data that we are collecting? Is there some kind of technology that exists for that? Actually, I think you know a lot of the EHR data that exists in electronic health records. You just take it as it is, okay. knowing there could be some flaws in that data. And so everyone must be able to state, listen, there's some outlier data here that might not make any sense to the question that we have at hand, but the bulk of the data is seeming very promising for us to elucidate this new question that we wish to make a, make a new labeling claim on, let's just say for example. So when everyone in the room together is making a statement and agreeing, look, there, there isn't, there might be some noise around this data. It's perfectly acceptable for those thresholds of noise. In general, when you t take records, you know, billions and billions of, of data points and you begin analyzing them, soon, you know, some signals begin to rise. And I think that, um, again, it's not, you're not running a gold standard randomized clinical trial that a lot of the regulators need to perform safety and efficacy. A lot of the movement in the real world data evidence generation is post-market. That's not to say that you can't use it in kind of the clinical setting. You can for rare diseases and things that there's very small patient populations for which you're, you are needing to address. Um, but nonetheless, everyone knows out loud, <laughs> everyone who's in the room, the regulators, all the stakeholders know that um, there are, um, you know, a, a sort of lesser uh, quality issue to that data, but they're not granting you a brand new, you know, claim per se. Exactly. So, um, so is there some kind of tips in terms of people that want to use those real world data to present them in, in, in a regulatory way to um, claim some, um, some efficacy of their product or efficacy of, of uh, the treatment that they provide to a patient or what, how, what, what are some kind of rules that they have to follow or good practices that they have to follow uh, and also with the regulators so that they, their data can be, if I can say, well used? Yeah, so what's really important for medical device companies, whether they're large companies, mid-size or small, is making sure that those vendors and those partners do have validated systems. Now, that's you know, EHR systems obviously have some methods of validation. It's only as good as the data inputs in it. And so what, what a lot of medical device companies should ask of their vendors, and these could even be the digital health, the telemedicine, just to assure that there's some audit trail that they have gone through their own quality system, that some even are uh, being applicable as a software, as a medical device, and they have, uh, they have their own labeling claim, for instance, that they're validated vendors, that they're just not using something that, um, you know, a, a university student made, uh, you know, for a graduate program or something like that, that there's, that there's you know, ISO standards around um, conformance standards around uh, that technology. And um, basically, I have found, I'm working with a couple digital health companies now that want to tag on either another part of their device or a drug as a combination therapy. What I have found is there's many channels it, with the regulators, the FDA, your notified body, who are willing to hear what you wish to do, right? And, and those data that you wish to uh, submit in your clinical evaluation report over time. And once you sort of get their buy-in, and once you relieve their concern that you are using validated software, that you are using ISO standard uh, technology or technology that uh, has FDA approval, let's just say, your, the uphill battle is a little bit smaller, right? So, so um, you have to do your homework in, in aligning yourself with vendors and with other tech companies who have done a lot of the heavy lifting to give you the assurance that when you go to your notified body um, using some of these data, that it, it's going to be quality at the end of it. 
Exactly. So um, we can also compare so real world data with uh, clinical data. Uh, there are some kind of differences in terms, as you mentioned, about the noise. When we have real world data, we can um, get uh, some information with a few um, few uh, parameters related to the, the patient. But when we are talking about clinical data, we are really screening each patient one by one to really see that they are uh, meeting uh, the expectations. So it's also some kind of uh, differences, as you mentioned, related to uh, the post-marketing surveillance and the CER uh, that mm -hmm. we have to uh, that we have to use. I think I just want to add one more thing to what we're talking about, Monir, and that is, you know, the whole uh, 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 like object, uh, the whole reason why we want to do um, real world data in the post-market surveillance segment of a product is to feed back new information about how the device is doing, right? And so it can kind of help say, hey, I actually see some signals in this new disease that we didn't even ever contemplate, whether it's physicians using this off-label or new indications. What that can then do is feed back into a unique clinical trial program mm -hmm. with mi more vigorous testing. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of different ways that people can use or medical device companies can use real world data. Not all the time will you be able to get a new labeling claim out of it. It might generate new interest for a new clinical trial program. No, I really, I think it's a, really a good point. I didn't thought about that, but it's true that um, you, we have too many ways to think. We have to think that, yeah, we have just to satisfy regulators and say we have to provide this and that. But if we are in the way to say, oh, we want to improve our products, uh, we want to uh, really monitor patients to make be uh, add a new feature to our products or to really improve it, I think it's also mm -hmm. another mindset. So we have really to take it uh, uh, to take it on, on that way, if I can say, to really uh, use it and to, uh, as you mentioned, to um, then open new projects, new products, just because you find maybe this tick on the on the data and say, oh, what happened here? What's uh, what's exactly the the situation? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Good. So, Althea, so um, now that we have those data, we have the regulators and we have, um, I mean, the regulation and regulators. So, um, is there any other point that companies have to be careful for that or is, um, is it all? Yeah, as I mentioned a few moments ago, it is not a panacea for uh, always addressing your responsibilities for post-market surveillance. In other words, once you're on the market, you have your CE mark, you maybe have clearance uh, in the United States, you're going um, commercial, rest of world, you still owe the regulators and yourself as a company the benefit of running additional clinical trials. And so by just simply saying, oh, we'll just do a little registry here, or we'll just do something cheap on the side, that doesn't cut it with the MDR anymore. That doesn't cut it with the US FDA anymore. And so, well, it never really did, <laughs> but, but what was common is a lot of companies convinced themselves that once they got on the market, free and clear. They didn't have to do anything else, right? But that's where all the trouble began. Exactly. That's where we started seeing lots of uh, uh, devices break down and, and repeat surgeries and things like that. And so, you know, a company should really embrace what post-market and real-world evidence could start gaining for them. Uh, I actually see it as new market channels and new market ideas. Yes, do some of those feed back into more robust clinical trials that eventually have to still prove safety and efficacy? Possibly. But what I've noticed is that even under MDR and even under the FDA, they're opening their eyes to the possibility of using real world evidence. And I think they have too, because I mean, uh, the, the, they will not stop progress. So we'll still uh, have that and uh, it will yeah. be more and more accurate. Uh, we have the artificial intelligence, machine learning, we have a uh, blockchain. So we have a lot of things that will come and maybe help us uh, also. So it's, um, yeah, I think they have to embrace also uh, the technology and to help us to use mm -hmm. it on the right way. Uh, and not just to uh, to let it be like a jungle where everybody do whatever they want with it, uh, and at the end nothing will be really uh, really good. <laughs> but what is what is really interesting is the fact that yeah, as soon as the companies are putting the product on the market, they should not stop now. They should really continue. It's why we have this post marketing surveillance. But 
you're right that sometimes yeah it's not really well used or there was not really um, a good a good feedback out of that and uh, yeah I hope that um, this episode and all the the content will help them to really understand what they should do and also uh, that the use of real world data will be maybe their next step and how mm-hmm. they have to do that with the the current regulation maybe it will evolve and also how to present that to the regulators and to be careful on that. That's uh, right. So, Alethea, something else to say to the audience? No, just lessons learned and what the key takeaways are is what we're talking about um, right now is, uh, you know, you've got to have the right plan. It's got to be in validated systems. It's got, everyone's got to be able to objectively describe how dirty or how good the data is. Um, and what the whole objective is of gathering that data. Is it to inform then some safety surveillance? Is it to then inform a new clinical trial program that then uh, gets you a new labeling claim? And what does that look like? Because we all are now faced with the revisions of these clinical evaluation reports, right? (laughs) And so now a lot of thought needs to be in, okay, we now have our market approval. Now we send in our CER the notified body granted us, you know, more time. Um, our our uh, certificate expires in 2025. What are we going to do in that in that period? Um, so, so these are sort of exciting times, but also stressful times because the regulations have changed. But look at the advent of uh, digital technologies, telemedicine, the the age of apps what you're saying, Munir, blockchain. I actually think that this could be an intermediary step to what we're going to be seeing in the next 10, 15, 20 years, which in my view may collapse a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the people in the middle basically to eliminate many of those um, steps along the way. So I think to streamline it through a blockchain initiative that's just on the horizon. I know there's lots of proof and concepts out there right now. And I would encourage your viewers to kind of just begin paying attention to that conversation. No, it's clear. It's really clear. And uh, yeah, as we said, progress is um, is uh, good. It can be bad, but in that case, it can be good. So <laughs> we have just to follow it. We have just to understand it. And then, uh, yeah, just to uh, execute it uh, right and not uh, use it on the, on the wrong way. Mm-hmm. Good, um, Alethea, so really thank you for this um, this time. Thank you for all the information that you provided. Um, I think it was really valuable and uh, I hope that people will really use uh, all those information to execute it right. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so it was great. I think, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you so much. So have everybody, so uh, thank you for listening. So uh, if you have uh, any few minutes, just uh, go... Uh, to the application or where you are listening to this podcast. And if you can really provide a review, it would be really great for me. Um, It's uh, helping me really to rank and also to provide this uh, podcast uh, to uh, more people. So it would be really nice and it will make my day. So thank you for that. Uh, And also, if you are really interested to uh, get some uh, webinars, so I also have that on my website. So you have just to go to school.easymedicaldevice.com to just see some webinars that we have selected and that can help you to grow and to get more skills. So Alethea, so thank you for your time. Thank you for your help. And I wish you a nice day. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Manir.